Good evening, and welcome to the fourth, fifth episode of When the Gap of Strikes. Happy New Year. I am Cherie Morris. I am the principal attorney for the law office of Cherie Morris. I am licensed in Alabama, Georgia, and Mississippi. I practice primarily personal injury and family law. Tonight, I want to talk to you all about personal injury. And I have just a couple of things that I want to talk to you all about just so that everyone can get out the misconceptions that they may have and maybe get some understanding about what a personal injury case is really like. First off, I want to talk to you about policy limits. So what that means is, um, and I'm strictly talking about automobile accidents, just to put it in some context. So everyone who drives a car has to purchase insurance and in the three states that i practice the minimum insurance that you are required to purchase is twenty five thousand dollars and that's liability insurance that covers you uh, if you hit someone in an accident if you injure them so say for example you're in an accident against someone who has only twenty five thousand dollars worth of insurance $25,000 is all the insurance company is required to pay out. So if you have medical bills, pain and suffering, lost wages, and other expenses that total $100,000, for example, the insurance company is only entitled to give you $25,000. Now to recover the additional money, you have to go after the person who hit you individually. So what that means is, so if that person has any type of money, assets, personal business, or anything like that, then you could sue them and get the rest of your money. So say you the $75,000 that you need, you can sue them for that. But they're not their insurance company is not required to give you a hundred thousand dollars just because they were insured, just because the person that hit you was insured with them. So whenever you hear uh commercials and other people tell you or other lawyers, you know, make claims that they can get you three hundred thousand dollars or four hundred or five hundred thousand dollars, that's not really the case if the person that hit you doesn't have an insurance policy at least worth that much. Now that's just in automobile accidents. Um, so if you're hit by a 18 wheeler or anything like that, most of those companies are required to have million dollar policies on those type of trucks. So in a situation like that, you may get 300, 400, 500 thousand dollars if you are injured in those type of cases. Um, the an, another where another place where you can get more money is it's not automobile accidents, but it's more like slip and falls, or if you're hurt on uh, in a business address or something like that. Most businesses usually have a million dollar premise liability insurance coverage. That's most. That's not necessarily required, but um, most of the larger stores that you might know of, like Walmart, Target, uh, your grocery stores like Kroger. Places like that usually have million dollar policies. Um, so if you're injured at one of those stores or something like that, then you might be able to recover all of your uh, pain and suffering, medical bills, lost wages, things like that. So just want you to, to know so that in the event that you get into an accident or you know someone who does, don't let uh, a lawyer or somebody who may not know what they're talking about tell you that you can get $100,000 for your injuries when the person that hit you only has a $25,000 policy or $50,000 policy for that matter. So that's really just um, one caveat. So the second thing I want to talk to you about is police reports. Now, I know uh, in my first video, I talked about the importance of getting a rep police report. So I'm not going to belabor that point just to just anymore. Just want to tell you guys, if you are in an accident, even if it's minor, even if you have, you know, just a hand sprain or a headache or anything like that, you want to get a police report. So always get a police report. Now, another thing with police reports, when you are giving information to the police officer, you want to make sure that the police officer captures your information accurately because that can definitely slow down your process. For example, um, you want to make sure that your name is spelled correctly. You want to make sure that your driver's license and 
your address is on there correctly. You want to make sure that your policy number is on there correctly. And you also want to make sure that if there's anyone else in the car with you, that their information is accurately reported on that police report. Because there are instances where somebody may have been hurt um, maybe two days later. You may not know about it, but they went to a lawyer and then they try to get the police report and their name's not on it because they were a passenger and you as the driver didn't ensure that they were on there. So you want to make sure that you're giving accurate information and that the police officer captures all the information that is necessary and required. Also, in the unlikely event that you get a police report back and the information on there is not accurate, you can ask the police officer who created the report to amend it to correct it. So don't think that just because they give you this report and it's inaccurate that you're finished. You can always ask them to correct it. And it's no big deal. It's no money that you have to pay. It's nothing extra. Just tell them that the information was incorrect. Give them the correct information and have them complete an amended police report. Now, there are some instances where the police officers will not come. And that usually happens when you're on private property. So in a private property situation where the police where the police tell you that they are not going to come out because they don't have to and they really don't have to um, and do a police report on private property, you in turn have to conduct your own investigation and turn it to the police. So what you want to do, you want to make sure that you take pictures of your damage you want to make sure that you take pictures of the other driver's damage. You want to make sure that you get pictures of how the accident happened. You want to get names, addresses, phone numbers, uh, statements for any witnesses who are willing to make any type of statements on your behalf. You want to make sure that you get an, a picture of the other person's driver's license. You want to get a picture of their insurance card so that it displays what kind of car is on the insurance, who the driver is, on who owns the car, and what the policy number is on that. So you want to make sure that you take a thorough record of everything if you are the one that has to complete your own investigation. And just because there is no police report, it does not mean that you don't get to have a claim for personal injury. So don't think that. Just you have to in turn be the investigator and conduct as much information as you possibly can. Another thing I want to talk to you about is I get this all the time when people get into an accident and they say, well, the other person didn't have insurance or they had fake insurance or whatever the case may be. They weren't on the policy. Whatever the case may be, that is not the end. So you can still file a claim. The difference now becomes you have to file a claim on your insurance under what's called uninsured or underinsured motorist coverage. Now, I touched on this in my first video, but I want to reiterate it because a lot of people seem to think that just because the other person wasn't insured, insured that their case is over. Your case is not over. You still get to seek the same type of compensation that you would have sought against the other person. Now it just comes from your insurance. And you pay your monthly premiums every month, whether you pay it monthly, whether you pay it semi-annually or annually, you pay it for a reason. So you want to make sure that you get the best coverage and the best compensation that you can, whether it's from the at-fault party or whether it's from your insurance company. <clears throat> Um, and also, if there's any med pay on your policy, you want to take advantage of that as well. Um, if you don't know what med pay is, go back to the first video. I definitely talked about med pay and explained it and why you want to get it on your policy. Now, the last thing I want to touch bases about and let you guys know is the entire process of handling a personal injury case. And it doesn't matter if it's um, an automobile accident, whether it's a slip and fall or anything like that. The process is kind of similar. So I know a lot of people think that the personal injury is a quick win or, you know, a quick way to get a lot of money. And that's not really the case. Um, so the way it begins is once you're injured, you have to, uh, one, you have to make the claim. So you have to call the at-fault at, at fault parties insurance company and let them know that you are making a claim for bodily injury. This has nothing to do with your property damage um, if you're in an automobile accident. So you have to make two claims, one for, automo one for property damage and one for bodily injury. 
So you definitely have to make that claim. Um, once you make that claim, the next thing you need to do is finish your treatments with your doctor. So whatever, whatever is injured in an accident, let's say um, you hurt your back and you have to go to chiropractic treatments. Most chiropractic treatments are anywhere between four weeks and eight weeks. So you can't do anything, your lawyer can't do anything, and the insurance company can't do anything until after those four or eight weeks are up. And that doctor has said, we are through with you. This is, um, we have recovered you as most as we could get, and this is the most that we can do for you. You are released from treatment. So once you are released from treatment, that is when your case kind of begins. So what happens then is your lawyer will then begin to request your medical records and medical bills. Now, depending on where you went to the hospital or where you treated, what doctor, those medical records could come in within a couple of days to a couple of months. And I've had some instances where it's taken a couple of months for medical records and bills to come in. For whatever reason, it's on them. It's not anything that we can make them do faster, slower, whatever. So you just kind of have to be patient and wait for them to turn in your medical records and bills to your lawyer. So once your lawyer has collected all of your medical records and medical bills, they will prepare what's called a demand. So your demand is really um, basically a written a written statement, I guess, but it's more like an argument from your lawyer to the insurance company just outlining your case, your injuries, and presenting a number that you're willing to settle for. So, uh, once the insurance company receives that, they take a look at everything that has been presented to them from your lawyer, and they'll usually respond. Um, I do know in Georgia that they have 30 days to respond, so you have to give them 30 days to respond before you can start requesting them to move faster or, you know, try to file lawsuits or anything like that. So, after they have reviewed information, most of the time they don't take the full 30 days, and that's whether it's in Alabama, Georgia, or Mississippi, they usually don't take the full 30 days to give you a response. Now, the response can be, hey, we're denying coverage to we're going to give you everything that you asked for or we're going to counter offer with this amount. So once you get that response, that's when your lawyer can start negotiating. Now, negotiations can last anywhere from a couple of hours to a couple of weeks. But once you have... Say the insurance company, say you and the insurance company kind of meet in the middle and you're satisfied with the number that they gave you, then your lawyer will tell you, okay, my client accept this number, send out all the paperwork, let's sign off on it, we get a release. So at that point, your case is settled. All the insurance company has to do is send a check to your lawyer. They usually take anywhere between a couple of days to about two weeks to send the check to your lawyer. Once your lawyer receives the check, they pay off all of your bills or in, and expenses, and then they cut you a check. So if you go through just the negotiation phase, your case is done, I would say within anywhere between six months to a year. Now, it does take a year sometimes, but that year usually depends on how long you're being treated and how long it takes your medical records to get to your lawyer. Sometimes it's a lot shorter. But anyway, so in the event that you or the insurance company are being stubborn or you don't want to you don't agree on a number then it's time for you to file a lawsuit so filing a lawsuit kind of starts your case over again so when i say file a lawsuit what that means the step is your lawyer drafts the complaint and files it with the court once it's filed with the court then it has to be served on the defendant. So what that means is the defendant has to receive a copy of the complaint and a piece of paper called a summons, which basically tells them that they're being sued and they have 30 days to respond and this is where to provide your response. Now, service can take anywhere from 48 hours after filing to two to three weeks, depending on if you have a correct address. So let's say everything is aligned, you have the correct address. So you can give it to a private process server, they get the person served within three days. You can give it to the sheriff, and the sheriff usually takes about two weeks to three weeks to get them served. And that's just because 
it's a lot uh, for them to do it they have a lot more do doing they have a lot less resources too than a private processing company might have so after service so now we're three weeks out from the day that you filed the complaint after they have been served now they have 30 days to respond to that complaint um, so you have to wait the 30 days before you can do anything so after they've responded, they'll file what's called an answer. And it's basically just saying, yes, I agree. No, I disagree. Or I, I agree with some of this. I disagree with some of this. So whatever the answer is, they have to file that with the court. And that's about 30 days out. Now, after that, what happens next is depend. it depends on your lawyer's trial strategy. Some cases can go straight to what's called a summary judgment hearing. So what that means is your lawyer will file a document called a motion for summary judgment. And the summary judgment just basically tells the judge, outlines the, your case, and it basically tells the judge the other person doesn't have a case that I pretty much want. It's nothing that they can defend on. Let's go before you so you can make that decision. So after that motion is filed, the other party has an opportunity to respond. So you have to give them 30 days to respond. Now, after their response is in, then you move to a summary judgment hearing, and that hearing can be scheduled at any time. It really just depends on the court that you're in and the judge's calendar that you're going before. So, at the summary judgment hearing, each side presents their case to the judge. The judge listens, makes the decision. You win or lose at summary judgment. Your case is done. So, say your trial strategy is not summary judgment. The next step likely is to have a deposition done and what a deposition is it's where you your lawyer the other person's lawyer and a court reporter is there the other lawyer gets to ask you questions about your life about your accident about the history of your injuries and you have a court reporter that's basically typing everything up and making a transcript of what's being said so once the deposition is over um Lawyers can come back and go to negotiations. Maybe there was something in the deposition that kind of cleared up why the other person didn't want to settle. Or maybe there was something that they found in the deposition that said, oh, we need to settle. So then they can go back to negotiations and you can actually settle your case right after deposition. So say negotiations doesn't happen. The next step is usually mediation. Mediation is where you, your lawyer, the other person's lawyer, sometimes a representative from the insurance company is also there. And then there will be a third party neutral uh, called a mediator that will be there. And the mediator is there to kind of help both parties come to a mutual meeting of the minds so that they can make a settlement agreement. Most parties, when they get to mediation, are usually able to make a settlement agreement because at that point, everybody's kind of ready to be done with the case. The insurance company is ready to be done with it. The client is usually ready to be done with it. And as long as the client and the insurance company is willing to change their position from their original position and kind of, you know, make some strides, maybe the insurance company need to go up on their offer. Maybe the client needs to come down from their asking and say they get to meet in the middle then your case is done the settlement agreement is done the mediator presents the settlement agreement to the judge the judge signs off on it case is done get your check within two weeks so in the unfortunate event that mediation doesn't go well your next final step is to go to trial and trial is like what you see on tv you have a judge you have the jury the lawyers present their sides, there's witnesses, everything like that. Once your case is done, you win or lose. You can get to trial anywhere from six months to two years out. Again, it all depends on the schedule of the court and the judge and whether or not there's any trials ahead of your case. So the personal injury process, whether it's an automobile accident, whether it's an 18-wheeler accident, whether it's a slip and fall or any other type of premise liability case where you're injured, it's not something that usually takes two months. A minimum is about three to six months. That's usually a good time frame. If you get your treatment done, your medical records in are, are in quickly, and you and the insurance company can come to a settlement. So six months is usually ideal. 
um, if it's relatively quick, if everybody agrees and we're on the money. So six months is a good, it's, it's a good time frame for you to kind of estimate. Once it goes beyond six months, you want to have a meeting with your lawyer and ask what's going on, how much longer. Um, but these are all the things that you want to sit down and talk to a lawyer about when you're interviewing lawyers, when you decide on who you want to give your case to. So don't let a lawyer tell you, oh, it'll be two, three weeks and we can get you some money. And that's not really the case, especially if you're still under a doctor's care. So just wanted to give you some information. I know there's a lot of misconceptions going on about personal injury and how it's handled. And I do know that in my profession, we're not always the most honest or we're not always seen as the most honest, but there are some honest lawyers out there. But do your due diligence as a client and interview different lawyers before you sign that contract because you want to make sure that they have your best interest, that they're knowledgeable, that they're not too overwhelmed um, to handle your case. So you don't want to get a lawyer who may be really good, but may have two or three hundred, 200 to 300 cases that they're dealing with, and they may not be able to give you enough attention on your case, and they may rush your case. So it's not that they're being a bad lawyer. It's just that maybe your case doesn't deserve as much time as, say, a case that's going to get them a million dollars. So that's it's not a shot at the lawyer, but you just kind of want to shop around to make sure that what you want out of your settlement is going to be is going is going to be that same um goal for the lawyer that you're going to hire so just wanted to let you all know that um as always if you have any questions you can reach me on facebook instagram or twitter at sheree morris law i can be reached at 678-903-3838 or 601-460-1779 i can always be reached by email Sheree, S-H-A-R-I, at SheriemorrisLaw.com. Again, thank you all for tuning in tonight, and I hope you all have a happy new year. Thank you.